Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00. I've been suffering from a sinus infection of late, which robbed me of my usual narration voice, but we're past the worst of that now. In a recent poll on my channel, I asked you what you'd like to see next, and it was abundantly clear what you wanted me to prioritise, so it is with immense pleasure I deliver that to you here today. While I have you, I just wanted to thank you all for sticking with me over these past few years. I came onto the Halo content creator scene relatively recently, and as such, made my debut when interest in Halo was waning. And in spite of the difficulties that we've faced over the recent years, you have all continued to show up, continued to support the channel, and kept us all moving onwards and upwards. Let's keep that momentum, so be sure to like and comment and share the video or the channel. It really does translate to helping the channel continue to grow and thus ensures that I can continue to deliver this kind of content to you. And one final thing before we get on with the video, over on Patreon you'll find we've had an overhaul of the tiers and a ton of new perks are making their appearance. New Zero Zero themed merch like t-shirts, artwork, hoodies, mugs and stickers are available and on top of that, I've arranged for special Halo themed merch to be built and sent out to qualifying Patreon tiers, including oddball skulls, plasma grenades, mini oddball keychains, and much much more. These perks will be rotated and I'm aiming on patrons receiving two of these a year approximately every six months. And even aside from that, jumping on as a patron helps support the channel and grants you a ton of perks, particularly in regards to the Discord server. So, if you feel like you want to go above and beyond the Call of Duty, you'll find the relevant links in the description. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the video. Today, we take a look at one of the most underrated fast attack vehicles of the UNSC, one that has been entrenched in the lore of the Halo universe since the insurrection and played a pivotal role towards the closing months, weeks, days and even hours of the Human Covenant War, and yet, while still being widely utilised across the UNSC, has gone practically unnoticed since 2553. The Hornet, whilst extremely versatile, easy to fly, and with a powerful but simple arsenal, this craft should be getting more attention than it is. So it's time we remedy that. I've used sources including, but not limited to, the Halo Encyclopedia, in-game lore from Halo 3, Halo 2 Anniversary, Halo ODST and Halo Wars 1 and 2, books including Contact Harvest, Legacy of Onyx and Divine Wind, and Halopedia to inform aspects of this breakdown, and where information is lacking, I've applied known principles of avionics, aerospace engineering and aircraft design principles to add additional detail to the breakdown which, while aren't strictly speaking considered as law, can be inferred from the aircraft's function and design and the overarching design principles that go into building practically any aircraft. Ladies and gents, let's mount up and get on with this most detailed breakdown of the AV-14 Attack VTOL, otherwise known as the Hornet. The AV-14 Attack VTOL, also known as the Hornet, is a fast attack and assault aerial vehicle in employment with the United Nations Space Command. Manufactured by Miss Rea Armory as early as 2524, the Hornet served as a reconnaissance, search and assault close air support aircraft. Unlike many other aerial vehicles previously covered in this series, the Hornet is an atmospheric craft, limiting its use to in-atmospheric operations rather than trans-atmospheric or exo-atmospheric operation as is the case with the Pelican, for example. The Hornet has an impressive multi-purpose capability and holds remarkable efficiency for a number of different combat situations, making it one of the most adaptable fast attack vehicles of the UNSC. The stubby wings are tipped with advanced turbojet engines on gimbals that provide the Hornet with its thrust and hover capabilities. On the nose of the Hornet is the mounting position for the Hornet's optics and sensor arrays. 
On the left side, a direct view optical sensor, laser rangefinder and target designator, and on the right, the pilot's night vision sensor, giving real-time night vision overlay to the pilot's heads-up display, built into the UNSC standard pilot helmet suite. Although it is worth noting, the system is likely compatible with Mjolnir's HUD systems, as well as the standard ODST visor systems as well. It is also worth noting that this nose equipment can be swapped out and replaced with auto cannons in some variants of the Hornet, or with cameras and searchlights with police and municipal variants. Beneath the nose, the front landing skid can be found with mounted landing gear lights. The cockpit of the Hornet is made only to seat a single pilot, although variants do exist with tandem seats, but this is markedly rare. The skids either side of the body double as jump seats for up to four additional passengers. There are connection points allowing the passengers to tether themselves to the craft directly, and it is known that the Hornet has mounting points for additional equipment, including a shock-absorbing gimbal arm for the Stanchion M99 SASR Gorse sniper rifle. Stay tuned for an armory video on the M99 Stanchion. The long tail of the Hornet houses additional systems including auxiliary power supply, while also serving to account and adjust the centre of mass of the craft, as well as providing some aerodynamic stability during sustained forward flight. The Hornet can also be given a chaff pod upgrade, which are pods that release copper nickel coated glass fibres or silver coated nylon fibres that can redirect and interfere with the radar tracking systems of tracking missiles, giving the Hornet a chance of surviving an engagement with tracking missiles from an opponent. Measuring 2.6 metres or 31.4 feet in length, 8.7 metres or 28.5 feet in width, and 4.5 metres or 14.6 feet in height, and weighing 4.1 tonnes, the Hornet is surprisingly heavy for a craft of such small dimensions. This is likely owing to Titanium A armour on the hull plating. The fuselage of the Hornet is a semi-monocoque, meaning it has a structural skeleton of supports and braces to keep its shape rigid and strong. The skeleton can also be considered its superstructure, likely utilising either an aircraft's grade aluminium such as aluminium 7075, or a grade 5 titanium to provide strength but light weight. Jutting out from the main body of the Hornet are the Hornet's stubby wings with the engine assemblies gyroscopically mounted to the wings, allowing thrust vectoring during flight. We'll cover this in more detail shortly. The hull plating of the Hornet is made of titanium A armour and composite plating, owing to the weight of the vehicle despite its small size. These damage-resistant panels are riveted or bolted to the lightweight underlying structure known as the airframe. The main structure of the Hornet is centred around where the wings of the Hornet join the body. This is where most of the shear forces will be applied due to the thrust generated by the engines on the tips of the wings, causing stress to be focused where the wings join the body. The wing's primary structure will be based around a simple wing spar, although will likely feature an additional internal cross-bracing beam and wing box, which ties the wing structure to the body of the Hornet, while also providing additional strength and rigidity to the structure. And the wing-to-body fairing looks to be armoured with the same Titanium A as the rest of the hull. It's worth keeping in mind that the wings of the Hornet do not provide any lift and are not aerodynamic components of the Hornet's flight capability. However, the tail and the skids likely both act as aerodynamic stabilizers when moving in the forward direction. Larger frame beams connected by longerons provide the core structure of the Hornet's airframe, buffeted by a network of stringers, intercostals and subframes that all work to provide additional structure and rigidity to the frame where appropriate granting a lightweight but extremely strong structure. While the maximum operating altitude of the Hornet hasn't been disclosed, the markings on the outer hull, warning of hull pressure, suggest that the craft is capable of operating above 10,000 feet, as generally speaking aircrafts don't need to pressurise their cabins unless operating above this altitude. So it stands to reason that the internal structure of the Hornet also features pressure bulkheads to maintain 
a pressured environment within when operating at altitudes above 10,000 feet, although pilots also tend to wear helmets with breathing equipment integrated into them in case cabin pressure drops. The engines of the Hornet make use of immense innovations in the field of centrifugal flow jet engines for the VTOL thrust capacity of the craft. The tips of the wings of the Hornet contain the engines for the vehicle nested within gyroscopic gimbals that grant the aircraft motion with the cyclic or right control stick, just as with helicopters. The gyroscopic gimbals allow the vectoring of thrust for the engine forwards and backwards and strafing left to right. The nacelles can also actuate independently to each other to enable yaw or rotation and pivoting in a static hover. This is controlled from the pedals. And finally the altitude is controlled via the left control stick or the collective that simply increases or decreases thrust accordingly to gain or lose altitude. The dual control sticks in the cockpit and its advanced nature points towards the Hornet utilising the fly-by-wire control system, which places the Hornet under full-time computer control, maximising safety by reducing the pilot's workload, and also increasing pilot situational awareness and improving aircraft handling qualities, rendering the Hornet much easier to control than a modern-day helicopter. There were very specific requirements of the engine of the Hornet to facilitate its form factor and performance characteristics. The craft needed to be small, approximately the same size as a Boeing AH-6, a small attack helicopter, but the use of titanium armour plating required a powerful method of thrust as the Hornet weighs over double the maximum takeoff weight of the AH-6. The Hornet had to be a nimble, manoeuvrable, but stable vertical takeoff and landing or VTOL craft with the ability to maintain an extended hover. The engine choice and position were picked specifically to meet these demands of function, being positioned at the top of the craft at the center line, facing downward to provide VTOL and sustained hover functionality, mounted on gyroscopic nacelles to allow vectoring of thrust exhaust but also specifically being a specially engineered version of the centrifugal flow jet engine to maintain an ultra low profile to avoid protrusion, wildly varying center of mass, excessive and misallocation of weight distribution and obstruction during function. In the early years of jet aviation, aircraft would use centrifugal flow jet engines. They became much less common when aircraft became larger and heavier and thus required higher thrust capacity, and thrust capacity is directly proportional to engine size, fuel air mix and compression ratio. To increase compression ratios with a centrifugal flow jet engine, the diameter of the impeller needs to increase. This caused problems as there is only so much space available beneath the wing of a commercial jetliner and the larger surface area translates to increased drag. Despite the fact that centrifugal compressors have a much higher efficiency in compression ratio per stage than an axial through-flow compressor, this space limitation, drag, and the problems with using multi-stage centrifugal compressors meant the near-universal movement over to axial through-flow compressors, trading the limitation of engine diameter with engine length and adding many more stages to make up for the lower efficiency. With most standard commercial jetliners in use today, they make use of high bypass axial turbofan jet engines. This means that there is a large fan at the intake of the engine. The fan moves air both into the jet engine itself as well as around the engine in a manner known as a high bypass. Basically similar to a conventional propeller, moving between 5 and 12.5 times the volume of air around the engine than through it, also known as a 5 to 1 up to a 12.5 to 1 bypass ratio. The air that moves into the jet engine meets a multi-stage axial compressor, compressing the incoming air to very high pressures, where it is then mixed with jet fuel and combusted. The explosive thermal expansion of the gases then accelerate towards the rear of the engine at a high thrust and velocity, 
turning a set of turbines at the rear of the engine which themselves rotate the fan and compressor stages at the front of the engine, thereby pulling in more air to maintain combustion. Even fighter jets make use of low bypass turbofans with afterburners for additional thrust capacity to transonic and supersonic velocities, but again, these aircraft have the limitation of a set of tolerance for engine diameter, but a much longer proportional engine length. The Hornet's engine position circumnavigates the limitations of diameter constraints of the centrifugal engine, but also require a very short engine length to neatly tuck within the engine nacelle pods on the tips of the Hornet's stubby wings without throwing out its centre of mass or being too large and cumbersome. It does this by having a very high intake fan velocity. The intake fans suck air into the centrifugal flow compressor. Centrifugal compressors suck air in at the front of the impeller and redirect them out towards the edges of the impeller where they immediately meet stationary compressor vanes that then redirect this flow of air. The volume available for the air at the intake versus the edges of the impeller are also massively reduced, forcing the air into a smaller area. The airflow then rather cleverly reverses within narrowed airflow ducts within the engine housing itself maximizing the compression ratio before sending it through to the combustion chamber, where it is then mixed with, likely, a more powerful military aviation fuel than is currently available. The combustion then expelling from the exhaust, turning the turbines to keep the compressor impeller and intake fan spinning. The two engines turn in opposition to each other, with one turning clockwise and the other turning anti-clockwise, as if both turned in the same direction, the inertia generated by their rotating component would generate a torque on the craft causing gyroscopic precession. The two engines spinning in opposite directions cancel out that torque generated by each engine, resulting in a net zero gyroscopic precession. The Hornet also has indicator marks on its sides just behind the cockpit indicating another set of air intakes for a jet engine. While it isn't known where this jet engine is located within the body, and for what reason, there are some features on the Hornet which could suggest at their function. One possibility is that the intakes on the body of the craft feed a low bypass jet turbine engine that exhausts towards the rear of the craft. Either near the rear of the Hornet via the grill-like vents on either side of the tail, or via the adjustable aileron-like structures on the wings of the Hornet, assuming they are not in fact ailerons, and rather thrust vectoring exhaust manifolds. I do lean towards them being for thrust vectoring, as the stubby wings of the Hornet are not aerodynamically shaped in the slightest, meaning the presence of ailerons wouldn't make any sense. The assumed function being that the Hornet could have something approximating a boost function or afterburner of sorts to enable the Hornet higher top speeds. Despite never actually seeing this in gameplay, something along these lines were hinted towards in the book Contact Harvest. Aside from this, the only other explanation I have is that it could also feed into the engine nacelles of the Hornet, as within the cowling, what look like exhaust vanes can be seen between the actual engine and its housing. Again, this could be to supplement and provide additional thrust, should it be needed. The cockpit of the Hornet is made only to seat a single pilot, although there are very limited versions that feature tandem seating, presumably to allow the weapon systems to be controlled by them rather than the pilot, although due to the small size of the Hornet, this would likely make the cockpit a particularly cramped space to work in. The skids, either side of the body, do have the ability to seat or stand up two people per skid, although, generally speaking, we only tend to see one per skid. This is likely to keep weight down and thus increase manoeuvrability. The single occupant nature of the craft and its fly-by-wire control system, employed alongside sophisticated targeting and heads-up display interface systems, allows the single pilot to operate the craft and fire the weapon simultaneously. The weapons of the Hornet are limited, but very powerful. As standard, the Hornet comes equipped with two Class II Guided Munition Launch System missile pods, 
firing M651 missiles that can identify, lock on, track and home in on a target. These are mounted in integrated missile pods attached to the underside of the skids. The Hornet also has two GAU-23 tri-barreled autocannons, capable of engaging a number of enemy units of various types, ranging from infantry to armoured vehicles and aircraft. This version is very similar to the one mounted on the Sparrowhawks, which can fire a full range of 20mm aircraft ammunition, although the standard loadout is either the M718 SAFI or PGU-42B APIs, with depleted uranium cores. When mounted on Hornets, the placement will differ based on the certain variant of the AV-14 Hornet. The GAU-23 is sometimes mounted on the craft's chin as a rotary cannon or more commonly two are mounted on the upper surface of the wings of the Hornet on standard weapon mounting interface pylons. There are of course benefits and drawbacks to both of these configurations. The nose mounted rotary cannon fires a 50 BMG ammunition and is mounted on an articulating gimbal that connects to the pilot's heads up display and enables the pilot to aim and fire the weapon by simply looking towards the target. But having the dual auto cannons grants the pilot much more firepower but the cannons are limited in their arcs of fire, requiring the pilot manually change the position of the Hornet to get a clear shot rather than relying on the gun's armature's freedom of motion, as with the nose-mounted cannon. The Hornet does feature an array of different variants based on specific applications, including, but not limited to, the 2531 Hornet, a specific variant deployed by the Spirit of Fire during the Harvest campaign, which differs in some notable aspects to the standard model, the most apparent being a single large rotary cannon built onto the nose of the Hornet, where the optics gear would normally be, rather than the two upper wing mounted rotary cannons seen on the standard variant. The AV-14B Attack VTOL, which is a heavily modified version of the AV-14 Hornet, designed and employed by the Spirit of Fire circa 2557 against banished forces. The airframe is considerably more bulky in shape, likely owing to increased armouring to account for the banished's more brutal weapons arsenal. The Transport Hornet is a variant without missile pods on the skids of the Hornet's aid in reducing weight and drag allowing this version of the Hornet to have a much higher top speed to rapidly insert and extract personnel from the battlefield. The Trooper Hornet is a heavily up-armoured variant of the AV-14B variant. The NMPD Hornet is a municipal police application Hornet with an attached searchlight on the nose, featuring the red and blue lights of a police vehicle and coloured black and white, and likely either disarmed completely or armed with less than lethal alternatives such as tear gas grenade launchers and rubber bullets. Several variants of paint finish for different environments also exist for the Hornet including Arctic and Snow Camouflage, Jungle, Standard Green, Camo Patterns and Dark or Black Night Stealth variants. One of the UNSC's most compact and lethal fast attack aircraft, the Hornet is typically used for combat reconnaissance, covert infantry insertions and aerial strikes against isolated targets. Its dual fire linked 20mm short barrel rotary cannons and its six auto-loading missile launchers make it remarkably threatening, but its relatively small size and exposed passenger positions on its skids does create some measure of vulnerabilities. Miss Rare Armoury has over a dozen variants of the Hornet currently in production, including limited exposure in civilian and municipal sectors. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below, and I look forward to what you have to say. And quick shout outs and thank yous to my patrons. Spartan 10148, my devastatingly effective Metarch class and Scylla. Silver Spartan, Leon, Ram, Prophet Bear, and Irrefutable Justice, my ever vigilant monitors. The careful tending of Alvin, Andrew, Brian, Cameron, Darian, Devon, Phantom, Flaming Halo, Cabal, Legions Lost, Michael, Spartan 0137, The Cave Potato, and Wolf Eclipse, my sub monitors. 
my growing fleet of strato sentinels, and my most loyal of enforcers, and all my awesome sentinels, sentries, and constructors who have jumped aboard on Patreon to help support the channel. You have my debt of gratitude. And, as ever, Todd Morrison, my Tier Zero Transcentient YouTube member. Thanks for keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, as it all helps the channel grow and helps me to continue to deliver this kind of content for you guys. And if you're ready for your next steps in evolution, head over to Patreon and become a patron there, or become a YouTube member to attain a higher state of being. Much love to all of you, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.